Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which digs a little deeper into the best of the food books. Now, we've spent the last couple of months hearing the voice of Yemisi Arabasala introduce the best food books of 2021 in a special series with the Andre Simon Awards. And by popular demand, this episode is all about her book, Long Throat Memoirs, Soups, Sex and Nigerian Taste Buds. You use a word in English, it's like you're using a a frying pan and hitting something and you just killed it. <laughs> the book won the Andre Simons John Avery Award in 2016 because of her use of food to prod under the skin of Nigerian life and poke at the politics and culture of her homeland. But in a country which doesn't really like to talk about what they're eating, I had to ask her why. Well, first of all, thank you, Jilly, for the opportunity. To be honest with you, when you first invited to write about the books, I thought, I can't do this. I always say that. I always sort of tell myself, no, you can't do this. And then it's such an incredible opportunity. So thank you. Okay, so why I use food, it must be connected to uh, an article I wrote about the church we were going to in Nigeria. And we were excommunicated and thrown out. And it was it was a very interesting time. <laughs> You're going to have to tell us this story, MC. Where, where was it and when and what did you say? Oh, my goodness. So Nigeria, Lagos, sitting in the church one day and something just made my skin crawl and I had to write about it. I felt compelled. And a year and a half later, there was all of this trauma, which, of course, I should have thought would happen but uh, it's funny how you just feel you have to do, you have to say something. So that got us thrown out and and that was it really. And I think from that experience, I, I thought to myself, can I really keep doing this? It doesn't, I want to write, but I need a medium that, as you say, gets under people's skin, you know, gets past their defenses and all their prejudices and all so you want to say something, but you don't want people's hackles to immediately come up. Uh, and, and food is just perfect for that because it's like inviting someone over. They, they rarely come over to fight. They, and, you know, walk into the room, the food smells nice. And immediately you can see all the tension just oozing out of them. <laughs> I mean, you do use analogy all the time and there's another one. But actually, let's just stick with that um, analogy with, with religion. You know, you were uh, you were excommunicated because you, you spoke too much. And in Nigerian food culture, you don't even talk about food, do you? It's not polite mm. to talk about yes. food. Well, now it's been over 10 years since this. And I was writing in 2009 when people said, what is it that you're talking about anyway? Nobody talks about this. Go away. So it's it's 10 years and, and everything's happened. Even in the world, everyone's talking about food. Everyone's talking about their own food. So Nigerians, it's not it's not a bad thing. Well, that's a massive shift in culture because it, yes, you do say in the book that yeah. you were well, somewhere in Somerset, I think, in a you know, terribly sort of middle England and, <laughs> and somebody was feeding you a lovely dish and, and you didn't say anything and that was seen as rude. I know. that It's very difficult to describe that experience. And these were really lovely people, people who embraced me, they brought me in and they were prodding me all the time and saying, so what do you think? What about the colours? And I was thinking, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good, but I, it's I, it feels a bit pretentious to be going... But I realised it was part of the culture here. Was, yeah. Oh, the colours are so lovely. Oh, look at... <laughs> but coming from a culture where people eat, and it's not that we don't talk about it, but it's not a thing. Expressed. Well, it's, it's not culturally done, is it? Mm. Well, it is what you do in the book. It is absolutely... I mean, it's about bringing tastes alive. It's about putting colour in something as prosaic as eating. And that is what you do in this collection of essays in Long Throats. Um, the idea of it was to really prod at the cultural politics and erotics of Nigerian cuisine. Very interesting. You do talk a lot about sex in this book. What is it about sex and, and food for you, Yossi? It's the same thing where I don't have to actually talk about sex. <laughs> I don't, I don't have, I've said this before, but as a writer, everyone expects you to be very vocal about sex because it's very in. It's always been in, forever and ever been in to be a writer and to be free and to just be able to say everything 
And that's the interesting thing, because this is the one topic that I don't really want to talk about. Well, that's one of your food moments. So actually, we are going to talk about it quite a lot. But we'll go into that a little bit later. The thing about the analogy really interests me. I'm I'm very interested in synesthesia. And, you know, I was talking to Mark Diacono about the way that he brings senses alive in his book. He does that beautifully, one of the shortlisted books that we discussed in the series. Your book reminded me more like Water for Chocolate. Um, You know, that wonderful idea that food is sense. It's not so much it's synesthetic. It is sense. So, you know, when you're talking about fermenting beans and sex again, uh, uh, you say, you know, in the presence of a fornicator, beans will turn sour, grow mold and give off an offensive smell. It's it's very much like that. Do you remember the stirring of the tears into the pot in in like water for chocolate? It changes. Emotions change the food um it's very complex it's very mysterious and it it seems to me to be very much about nigerian culture not just food culture let's dive into it so that we can explore that through your food moments you say there's a drought of expression about food but not in this one you let's let's start with the masala with chicken um it's a lovely opportunity you say to show off this powerful soup with all these fabulous ingredients but tell us why you wanted to choose that as your first food moment well because this is a real life story of a woman who is married to this man and she's very strong and he has a problem with that and in order to sort of bring her powers down he has to get his whole family behind him so he's constantly creating this scenario where he's driving her off to the village and then she has to go there and she has to kneel but there is this power she has that he can't resist to the end, which is that she cooks this aromatic, it's not really a soup, you know, but then she puts all of these spices in and all of them are those kind of spices that make you, and I hate that word, secrete. <laughs> it's a kind of, it's a kind of, they're gingery, they're peppery, they're, they're hot, they're, they're cool. They're, and, and that balance it, it's medicinal, but it's also very, very emotional. It feels like uh, uh, a piece that you could pull out and it would represent all the things that I'm trying to say. Because apart from putting all of these beautiful spices and thinking about them and identifying them and talking about what each individual thing does, and then when you put it together, it becomes this different thing. And it just also is a metaphor for for love and emotions and and all of the like for example with all of these couples that have been together for years and they love each other to death but they're ready to kill each other <laughs> and you, how do you separate all of these things you just have to just put them together and accept that they go together so that i love the <laughs> idea of these people you know these people who've been together forever sitting down over a, a soup in inverted commas with calabash nutmeg alligator peppers grains of paradise you know crayfish all of this is the foreplay she does the cosmetic bowing and scraping right and there's a nephew who's the one who tells me this story who's carrying a chicken back and forth to make the apologies so She's cooked the soup and then she wins because this man now sits down to the food that he, this woman who he allegedly or supposedly hates has cooked. And he eats it with so much, you know, he, he wants to eat it. He's eating it. And then afterwards, something else happens. So you think, well, <laughs> have you really won? You're so ridiculous. You know, I just love this idea that, that they're taking part in this ritual, this wonderful kind of rich soup without saying anything about the soup, because you don't in Nigeria. Yeah, all these emotions are being stirred up. It's a wonderful way of talking about how extraordinary this food is, how much is going into it, and how much is going into the marriage, and all the mix of emotions. (laughs) (laughs) Food is obviously what is fed to us, and it makes us who we are. We are what we Mm. eat. And, you know, this maelstrom of emotions is is happening amongst you in in this wonderful story yet nobody's actually talking about Mm. it now you say nigerians are whiners but they never whine about food so if they're not talking about it and they're not whining about it what are they doing when they're actually sitting around the table it's an interesting question so i'm trying to sort of think about you know my family sitting around you'll probably be talking about 
relatives. You'd be if you had a huge family ga- gathering, it would be probably someone's birthday or it would be one of those Sundays where you all decided to meet, just like any other family in any other country in the world. So you'd be talking about other things. You'd be talking about who's getting married, who's having a baby, who's, you know, so the, the, <laughs> I mean, you might comment, oh, this is very nice jollof rice. Who cooks this? But it wouldn't be that. It, 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 would, it would be a passing thing. Yeah. And then everybody would move on to, to, to something gossip. else. It's a, there's a lot of gossip and, and can I say judgment? Mm. Uh, you, you, make, you, you do talk a lot about judgmentalism and particularly at the market. You talk about you going to the market and being eyed up and down because you're not wearing the right thing. And the, the, the way that you know about food and the way that you dress when you go to market to mm. buy food is very important. You know, that, again, doesn't tally with this sort of food is everything, but we don't talk about it. I know. It's, it's, it's interesting in, in Nigeria. This came up recently as well in conversation where you have to look a certain way. So a woman, a woman my age should ideally have more, more presence in the sense I should have a bit more flesh on me, right? My, <laughs> my hair should look a certain way. I should wear a little bit more makeup so that people can call me that it's an interesting word, it's madame. And it's said exactly like that. So if a woman my age is wearing jeans, so there's a kind of, how can you be wearing je- jeans? I mean, women my, my age do wear jeans, but there things are set in place and people don't really try to move them around too much. So I would have to look a certain way to go to the market and not get the kind of very snide, condescending put downs that I get. You know, on the one hand, you're talking about dressing a certain way, but actually the the way that you describe most of the food, the, the experience is very inner, and I wonder if that's why you don't talk about it. You know, there's something quite sort of crass about expressing too much emotion. Uh, with, with yokro soup, for example, which is your second food moment, it's it's kind of like gumbo meets chicken soup for the soul, mm, isn't mm, it? Mm, it is. And you, and you wouldn't talk in... I don't think that you would talk about chicken soup for the soul. You'd just... Give it to somebody who's ill. You'd take it if you are ill and know that it comes with a great amount of love. Is, is that it? I think that, I think, yes, it's a good summary because okra soup is something that we eat all the time in Nigeria. So it's good for you. But then why waste words on it? Just eat it. <laughs> We're not very emotional people in terms of expressing emotions in words. So just tell us about the okra soup that you had at the Yellow Chili restaurant in Lagos. It was incredible because, and it was a one-off, so I went to this restaurant and I'm, I'm not great on eating restaurant food, but this time I went and I bought a bowl of okra soup. It was takeaway, they put it in a plastic container and I didn't think much of it. But then I got home and it was very interesting. First of all, someone had cut the okra in a particular way uh, with a lot of detail. And then it was green. It wasn't overcooked. It had goat meat in it. It was beautiful. It had a very lovely aroma, a bit of palm oil, pepper. It was just gorgeous. And I just thought this in a white bowl would be fine dining. I mean, no matter what people say about the mucilage, you know, in okra and how that immediately just holds up your approach. If you're not used to eating the soup and you start to think, oh, I don't really want to eat okra soup, but it was so beautiful. Um, I, I, I don't, I can't think of anyone who could have resisted that bowl of okra that day. But you describe <laughs> the okra as a two, it, it's two way lubricating qualities. <laughs> and that is about relaxing the esophagus on the way in and on the way out. <laughs> so you have this kind of dual idea of pleasure, you know, because there's nothing more pleasure than actually good food coming in the right way and going out the right way. So <laughs> Let's go on to your third food moment, which is about the horror of the writing class. And of course, anybody who has ever been to a writing class will hoot oh. with laughter at this story. Um, <laughs> Tell, tell us about the snail tree. So take us into your writing class. Ah, oh, that writing class. It was incredible because it was... <laughs> we, we came in 
and there was already that sense of, yes, we're going to talk about sex. And I was like, no, I don't want to talk about sex. And mix of, mix of male and female writers, very relaxing environment. And I thought, oh, then you put in Binya Vanga, Wainaina, the Kenyan writer, and such a powerful writer, powerful voice. And he was the one who brought in that, oh, we're going to talk about sex and we're going to talk about writing sex. And because it's a problem, let us say, in quote, with Nigerian writers. This is 2012. So perhaps there was still a bit of restraint okay. at that time. So for some reason, Binyavanga brings up a snail tree. There's, and I think that there was a confusion in his mind that snails live on trees. <laughs> <laughs> but, for, but for me, what it did was, it just, it was like a pop in my head. And I thought, mm, snail tree, snail tree, of course. And, and you know how snails <laughs> drip. And so to, to use that as, I don't want to open my mouth and say certain things, but if yes, you do. I draw yeah, a see. snail yes, you so do. <laughs> <laughs> if I draw, if I draw a snail tree for you, and I put snails in it, and you can see dripping. What do you, th what do you think? What do you think of? I might add um, that you actually start this chapter by saying sex is overrated. Yet you have it just it is overrated though. It, it it is. It's in all kinds of um, spheres where sometimes. Oh well, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the point of you saying that, that sex is overrated is that everybody is so hyperbolic in, in writing classes anyway, aren't they? Uh, and certainly when they're writing about sex and you wanted to just absolutely pop that balloon. OK, you're right in the sense that, look, what usually happens with people is when they're talking about sex, they're very... The word is crass. So you have people come in and they have... Um, seven ways to do this, five ways to do this. Oh, um, you know, and you're like, are, you, are we talking about the same thing? Because <laughs> you have to, I think you actually have to invest in the parables. If you don't, you, you just create this thing that has, it's like two dimensional, it's dead. And, and that was what was happening a lot in that um, writing class where people wanted to write it as vividly as possible. It, what, what I'm picking up here is there's a reticence to use language about a particular subject. The, the reticence to express desire and pleasure, which, let's go back to it, this is exactly what you're saying in your book, is the issue in Nigerian food culture. And in this particular essay about the snail tree, it feels to me that there's this kind of push and pull to kind of explore that, that feeling about how to talk about pleasure i agree i th i think also because we're people who have 200 languages then someone came and said you all of you have to sort of you, you need some unifying language and that language is english but you have to think about people who have been thinking about things and talking about things and in their genetic makeup there's a memory that is not english so you say, put this in English. How do you really do that? How do, you, how do you express in English? So you find a lot of very, very, very sophisticated thinkers in other languages in Nigeria who have a problem saying, this is what I mean. So when you, when, when you want to talk about pleasure, and then you, you use a word in English, it's like you're using a, a frying pan and hitting something and you just killed it. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just killed it. So I was hoping with that snail tree that I would do what Binyavanga did for me, where I just went, oh, wow, okay. Now that's an image. And what can I do with it in my head? And I don't have to say anything to anybody about what's happening in my head. <laughs> it is a shortcut. It, it leads us very nicely onto your final food moment, which is about fine dining in, in Nigerian food culture, that there's a performative nature to fine dining that the Nigerians just won't do. It seems to me that to be quite a clear message that you're giving, that food is... It's practical and it represents so much that is inner. Fine dining is all about 
show and performance and kind of gets away from the very essence of what food is to you. There is a lot of fine dining going on in places like Lagos or Abuja. Where you can eat anything. You, you say that it's a really global city now. Exactly. But when you want to talk about the people that can afford to go into these places, they're very, very, very small percentage of people that can afford it. So what are Nigerians actually eating? And it's not fine dining. That is where I'm going. And as you say, there is a relationship to that food that is happening outside all of these places. And that is a love affair. That is where the love affair is really happening. And how do you express that? How do you, how do you show it? You use comparisons like there's this man, he, he's in love with this woman. She's not. She doesn't look the part. So instead he takes out this other woman to show her off, whereas his heart is somewhere else. It's a beautiful analogy. Now, let's wrap up by t- talking a little bit more about the Andre Simons. This episode's going out uh, after the awards have uh, been Zoomed to us all, the, hopefully the last one of the Zooms, and we'll all be back in real life next year. Um, what has being the food assessor for the Andre Simons this year meant to you? What have you learnt about food culture? that tells you more about yourself as a Nigerian in London? This is one of the most profound opportunities I've had. I've been here for three years and seven months, and I'm I'm actually being asked to do this. This is really incredible. And to have those books arrive. Sometimes when you're standing in a bookshop, it's not the same because you're at a distance from, from the books. But when a book arrives in the house and you open it up and you see the amount of work and all the people who have invested in that book. And you, you, you can actually really sense it close up. Now, to have 120 of that turn up at your door is something that is very difficult to describe to people. It's such an incredible, incredible experience. It was a humbling experience as well, because I realized I really don't know anything about anything. I don't, because you, when you're on social media or you're talking to people all the time from different parts of the world, you, you tell yourself you know everything. But then you hit 120 food books and you think, I don't know anything about anyone or anything. And I have to, I have to actually think more about people and their cultures and their relationships with food and, and what humanizes them. And then to have to go through them and into the minds of all of these people and then make a decision. It's a roller coaster of emotion, of feeling loss and then thinking, oh, this is such a beautiful book. How do I not include this book? But only so many people can get to this point. So, and this, ex- this is going on from what, October yeah. till March. So it, it's incredible. It's an immersive experience yes. in so many different people's ideas and, and feelings Ooh. about their food culture and their take on it. And you've gone from, you know, Mark Diakono's herb to Yasmin Khan's journey through the Eastern Mediterranean to, you know, Di Ritali bringing her childhood in rural Ireland to change British food culture in baking. I mean, there's so much of it. How on earth did you come up with a winner? there is a book or there are books that pop up like Mark Diacono's book they just pop out of the pile because the the voice uh the ideas the mind with Di Ritali as well and Dan Saldino so the thing is to spend the time going through the books again and again and again and thinking about them and looking at them. I've already said at the end of the uh, Yasmin Khan episode, which goes out on the day of the awards, that (laughs) that my money goes on her. Um, But I have to say, only because, I mean, I love all of the the final seven books, and I think that each one of them could have been a winner. And I think that they are winners. By the time you get to the shortlist, I think those are the winners. They are the best books of the year. But I think that, you know, the reason I choose Ripe Figs is because of what's happening in the world right now. And I think that any book that really brings up that relationship between food and rupture, you know, that makes you really understand more about the human condition, I think that's for me. Just for me, that's why Ripe Figs is is the winner. Um, but, you know, right now I don't know what the winner is. Um, 
What do you think choosing the best book of the year contributes to the world of reading? I mean, yesterday was World Book Day. Do you think these awards actually help us find the better books to encourage more of a love of reading, more of more of a, a culture of reading? Oh, yes, I think so. I think they set a standard. There's no way that you would go through 120 books that the standard would not automatically go up because that book is, is sitting on the top of 120 books. So what it does is if you are the sort of person who wants to write a food book, you're thinking to yourself, I want to write a book that is unique. I want to write a book that says something that hasn't been said before. And if you think about one year, there's 5,000 books, you would have to really be saying something unique. You would have to be writing extraordinarily well. You would go that extra mile to give something to the world that hasn't been done before. And that is the value of having an inner world, and which is probably what you mean by ripe figs, where Yasmin Khan has dug in to talk about the world. And that's why it's a successful book. For you, as a, a winner of an Andre Simon, the John Avery uh, Award in 2016, do you feel that through, through an award-winning book you are able to say more about the politics and culture of Nigeria? Definitely. And the Andre Simone Prize pushed that book into a different global um, limelight. So people everywhere looked at the book and said, oh, OK, we want to read this. And this is on Nigeria and this is interesting. And this platform of the Andre Simone opens the most incredible doors in the most incredible rooms and earns you a lot of respect. It puts your voice out there. And then you can talk more about what it is you were talking about in the book. And I can say, I'm not an expert on Nigeria, but I can say, oh, this is my experience. This is where I come from. And sometimes when we're thinking about cultures that are outside ours, we flatten the culture. And it's important for someone out of that culture to come and say, this is really what we're thinking. This is what we're eating. This is how we eat. So that has been such uh, and a profound opportunity for me. And the Andrew Simon is the reason for that. And then to, to come back and be able to, to assess that prize is just something that I never thought was going to happen. Thanks for listening. You can also find me on Food FM, the online radio station and global podcast platform which aims to change the world through food. Do get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram and at Jilly Smith on Twitter. And you can sign up for my newsletter at JillySmith.com. I'll be back next week to take you deep into the Himalayas with the authors of Taste Tibet, Yeshi Jamba and Julie Kleeman. 